peace and pan-Africanism, peace and pan-Africanism. This is your big brother, King Kong Consciousness, Dr. Umar Ifatunde. Y'all see where I'm at right now, right? On this day, 55 years ago, the last great leader of black America to give us a comprehensive program and plan for political, economic, and social change was assassinated on this spot 55 years ago. The great reverend is 307. So brothers and sisters, we here to pay homage to Dr. King on the day we lost him 55 years ago, Divine Lorraine Hotel. I'm going to be hanging out here for about an hour, brothers and sisters. So my Memphis Africans, if you need to come holler at me, I'm here. If you're in Memphis right now, you want to come holler at the Prince, I'll be here for a hot minute. I'm going to go inside the museum. They got a special exhibit going on, but I just wanted to be here because I've never made it here on the day Dr. King died. Y'all, this is the first time I've been to this museum on this day. I've been to the museum, but never on this day. Dr. King was murdered, murdered on the governmental orders of the president, the FBI, the CIA, with participation from the Tennessee KKK, Memphis Police Department, Memphis Fire Department. Y'all know Dr. King was not even supposed to stay in this hotel. Dr. King was not even supposed to stay at the Lorraine Hotel, but he was being criticized by black people for staying at the Holiday Inn. He was being criticized by black people for staying at the Holiday Inn, so they switched the hotel. And then after they switched the hotel, somebody from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Atlanta, someone from the SCLC office called and asked him to move his room from the basement floor, the ground floor, to the second floor. There's only two floors here. There's only two floors here. They moved his room from the bottom to the top so they would get a better shot, brothers and sisters. And then Dr. King survived the shot. He got to the, ho to the hospital. They took him to the hospital and he was suffocated to death at the hospital, brothers and sisters. Never forget Dr. King. Dr. King was born in a very uh, successful middle-class family. His father, Daddy King, successful pastor. He did not have to give his life for African people. Dr. King did not have to give his life for, to African people. He could have went and been a T.D. Jakes. He could have went and been a Creflo Dollar. He could have been a mega church minister. This man had a doctorate degree, seminary degree, came from a family that was comfortable, at least according to the standards of that day for black people. He didn't have to turn all that away. We talk about Guatemala Buddha giving up his royalty. Dr. King is a modern day Buddha, a modern day black Buddha. He gave up all he could have been to sacrifice for African people, brothers and sisters. I want to see that. What, what, what room y'all said it was? The black one. I'm going to show y'all the room, brothers and sisters. We on ground zero. Three oh six. I was. It's three oh six. Okay. So I'm gonna show y'all one time. If y'all can see that, y'all see that black up there? Can y'all see that black hanging? That's room three oh six. Y'all see that black? That's where Dr. King was assassinated, right there. He was not murdered by James Earl Ray, brothers and sisters. James Earl Ray did not murder Dr. King. Dr. King was murdered by a sharpshooter from the Memphis Police Department on the strict orders of J. Edgar Hoover, the CIA, the President of the United States. The Memphis Police Department killed Dr. King, not J. Edgar Hoover. I need y'all to understand that. I need y'all to understand that. That's where Dr. King took his last breath. Room 306, brothers and sisters. If you've never been to the National Civil Rights Museum, you need to come. It's my second favorite museum after the Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. So we're here to pay respects to the last great leader we had to give us a plan. We got a lot of leaders giving us a bunch of talk, but we don't have no leaders leading us anywhere. They're just talking. No walking. Dr. King was not a talker. He was an activist, a revolutionary, a scholar. He gave his life to African people. He said he, we may not, he may not get there with us, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Brothers and sisters, it's up to us 55 years later, and we are not showing Dr. King the respect he deserves. We are not keeping the dream alive the way that we should have. Dr. King died for economic justice. He did not die for desegregation. He did not die for integration. He did not die because he had a dream. Dr. King died in Memphis because they could not let him come to Washington, D.C. to lead the breadbasket campaign. That was his next stop. 
DC. He died in Memphis, so he would never get to DC. Dr. King was bringing poor people from all over the country to DC. They were going to erect the tent city, and nobody was leaving until everybody had a house and a job. Economic revolution. Dr. King was going to force America into a radical redistribution of America's wealth, and that's why he was murdered for economic justice and we still cry for economic justice we still fight for economic justice but as a people who waste two trillion dollars every year we got to look in the mirror too brothers and sisters this is not all about the u.s government we spend 30 billion dollars on fake hair we spend two billion dollars on air jordans we spend 800 dollars on poor meat we spend 20 million dollars on children's cologne two billion dollars on video games why somebody calling me when i'm live i hate when they do that so brothers and sisters, I just want to let y'all know I'm here honoring Dr. King as the Prince of Pan-Africanism, Dr. Umar Johnson, and the struggle continues. Peace and Pan-Africanism. Yeah, there was three main reasons that uh, Dr. King was assassinated. One was his opposition to Vietnam. Yes. As you know, war is big business. Mm -hmm. Because once people go to war, the corporations get to uh, provide the war with whatever they need. That's billions of dollars. Yes. So he was speaking against the business interests of corporate America. That's one reason. Mm -hmm. Second reason that Dr. King was assassinated was Lyndon Baines Johnson had uh, put together a Kerner Commission to study the causes of the riots of the long, hot summer of 1967. Okay. And if you remember, Newark, New Jersey and Detroit, Michigan led the way with the 67 riots, yes, right? Indeed. We yes, didn't indeed. see nothing like it again until Rodney King. Okay, so when the Kerner Commission released this report in 68, mm -hmm. they provided Dr. King with all of the statistical information and anecdotal information to support his breadbasket campaign that he announced on December the 4th of 1967 and was going to be initiating the day after he left Memphis. Mm. Dr. King did not, was it murdered in Memphis for reasons to do to Memphis. Mm. Dr. King was murdered in Memphis because his next stop was D.C. So with the breadbasket campaign, he was going to bring poor Americans to D.C. Nobody was going to leave until they had a home and a job. Mm. This would have embarrassed the American capitalist white power structure. Yes, they said we can't let him come here. So they lured him to Memphis by killing the sanitation workers that got crushed up in the uh, trash truck. Yes. That was a deliberate murder by the FBI. Really? To get King back to Memphis, yes. Okay. Because if he didn't come back to Memphis, he was going straight to D.C. Correct. They had to get him to Memphis so they could take his life. So the breadbasket campaign never takes place. But getting back to the Kerner Commission, the Kerner Commission was so powerful because it was ordered by the president. So your own researchers mm. came back and said the riots was caused by racism, sustained by racism, yes, sir. perpetuated by racism. Basically, the reason Dr. King was going to D.C. with the breadbasket campaign right. was fully justified and researched in the Kerner Commission report. Dr. King had to die because once he got his hands on that Kerner Commission report and going to D.C. with the breadbasket campaign, he would have forced the economic revolution in America, radical redistribution of resources. You would have saw this country be forced to redistribute the resources of this country if Dr. King would have made it to D.C. What about some of the inside people that he was close to, black? A lot of, of us were involved with that. We, um, we betrayed him. Infiltrate oh, we absolutely did. FBI. Absolutely we did. We know for a fact that Dr. King was supposed to stay at the Holiday Inn Hotel in Memphis. Okay. He was not supposed to be at Devon Lorraine. The reason Dr. King's hotel was switched from Holiday Inn to Devon Lorraine mm. is members of the black community found out that he was not staying at the black hotel. And so oh. they started criticizing Dr. King for staying at the white hotel. So Dr. King's team said, we got to switch you over to Devon Lorraine due to this criticism. We find out after the fact, the criticism was fabricated. They needed to get Dr. King to the Devon Lorraine Hotel because it was an easier target. The windows over there, mm -hmm. the balcony over there, mm -hmm. it's like a shooting gallery. Perfect scene for an assassination. So they manipulated that mm -hmm. criticism to force Dr. King to the Devon. Now, once he gets to the Devon Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, he's assigned to a room on the ground floor. Somebody from the Atlanta office of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference called Devon Lorraine and, and requested that Dr. King's room be switched from the ground floor to the top floor so they could have an easier shoot. What? Yes. We also know that at least two of the reverends there knew that Dr. King was likely to be murdered on that day. And according to the King family attorney, William Pepper, mm -hmm. anybody can research. Do your research on William Pepper. Okay. Go on YouTube, watch his interviews. This is the attorney that sued on behalf of the family, proven in court that it was the FBI who killed him, not James Earl Ray. According to William Pepper, Jesse Jackson, mm -hmm. 
allegedly, this is according to the white attorney, Jesse Jackson was a collaborator with the FBI to some extent Ooh. with the Dr. King murder. And one of the pieces of, two pieces of evidence that make Jesse look guilty. Piece number one. And by the way, from what I understand, allegedly, mm -hmm. Reverend Jesse Jackson was not allowed to attend Queen Mother Coretta Scott, Scott King's funeral. When Coretta Scott King died, Dr. Mm -hmm. King's wife, mm -hmm. widow, Jesse was not allowed to attend the funeral. That's what I've been told because his family believed that Jesse was involved in their father's murder. So anyway, two things that make Jesse look guilty. Mm -hmm. There was a group of local security that came to protect Dr. King in Memphis. Just like my brothers come to secure right, me. Right, right, right. Grassroots security. There was some grassroots security that came to support Dr. King. I forget their names, right? right? Jesse Jackson told them they were not needed. He called them off. He made them leave the hotel. They showed up to defend Dr. King's life. Jesse Jackson told them they were not needed. That's guilt number one. Guilt number two, if you watch the video, go on YouTube and watch the video moments before Dr. King was murdered. Mm. They get out the car, they walk upstairs to the balcony. You see Jesse looking like this the whole time. What is Jesse looking for? It's on YouTube. Go watch it yourself. Je why is Je what is Je what do you know is about to happen that got you looking in every direction around the hotel, bro? I want you to watch that yourself. And they have pictures of them showing them all on through. Reverend Abernathy. Oh, this straight video. Him. This straight video. Oh, yeah, yeah. Straight video. Jesse doing this, walking up the steps. If I'm walking with you up the steps and I'm doing this, don't you that mean I... You know something about, know something about the pop. Here's the third piece. The Green Berets of the U.S. Army mm. were the backup killers. The, the, the man who killed Dr. King, I forget his name, but he was a sharpshooter for the Memphis Police Department. But you know, the government doesn't take chances. They double up. So the Green Berets was put on the roof of the building where they claim James Earl Ray shot from. Green Berets of the Army was up there. The Green Berets were the backup killers. The Green Berets, according to their testimony, who was on the roof, right. they were told to make sure they didn't shoot anybody who was not wearing a shirt and a tie. They said anybody wearing flat, if they were flat collared, mm -hmm. they were a friendly. The exact word was friendly. So here's the question you got to ask me. If the Green Berets were told friendlies were not wearing suits and ties, they would be wearing flat collar. Might have on a suit, mm -hmm. but a flat collar. How did Jesse Jackson know not to wear a shirt and a tie that day? And on Jesse that note, was flat collar. Jesse and, was flat collar. And you're right, because he had a jacket on. Yeah, I saw, I, I flat. I the picture. No tie. Look. This is getting hot. We're going to come right back because you're going to talk about more about this. Yes, sir. Yes, and you're going to drop some more gems for our brothers and sisters. And he also showed up. We're coming back. Okay. Okay. That was, see, I had, I had that. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Deep. 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 Wow. Dude, you, you, you light it up. I love it. I love it. With the Dr. King situation. Yes, sir. And we was hitting on this while I was on the mic. Jesse Jackson, I noticed when you threw And that Reverend after, Billy Kyles. Reverend Billy, Billy Kyles. Kyle, yeah. Or Billy Cole, Billy, Billy Kyles. Billy Kyles. Was the Reverend who was on the balcony with Dr. King. And when he walked away, that's when Dr. King got shot. And when they interviewed him, he said, he slipped up. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. Yeah. He said, as soon as I moved away so they could get a clear shot, the bullet rang out. Those are his exact words. It's on YouTube. As soon as I moved away so they could get a clear shot. How you know who getting a clear shot and how you know a clear shot was coming? He knew. So James Earl Ray was a scapegoat. He was the scapegoat. And they were grooming James Earl Ray for at least two years before they assassinated Dr. King. So Dr. King's murder was already being planned in the event that they wanted to carry it out. But once that Kerner Commission report came out, and once that breadbasket campaign got started, they had to take him out. So Jay And a buddy of mine, Murdoch, who you know, old sizey brother Murdoch, mm -hmm. do you know he was locked up with James Earl Ray in Tennessee? I don't know if he was a celly, but he was locked up with him. One of my buddies was locked up with James Earl Ray mm -hmm. in prison. So... J. Edgar Hoover. Yes, orchestrated the whole orchestrated thing. Orchestrated the whole thing. But the CIA was in it as well because Dr. King's comments on uh, Vietnam made it an international issue. Remember, FBI domestic, CIA global. You mm. feel me? So when Dr. King started commenting on global issues, that automatically brings the CIA in. What do you mean? Okay, now we're going deep now. So I'm going to right. this. And when Dr. King got Man. to the hospital, <laughs> first of all, Dr. King did not die on the balcony. He was suffocated. He was suffocated yeah. at the hospital with a pillow. How do we know this? Whoa. Dr. King died in the Memphis hospital, not on the balcony. Don't get me wrong. 
Had he survived, he would have never been the Dr. King we know. You follow me? He would have been right, severely, right, right, right. Uh, developmentally, yeah, the head. yeah, dysfunction. However, he was still alive. So according to the testimony of a white nurse, she said that the police came into the room where Dr. King was and somebody took the pillow, might have been an FBI agent, took the pillow, put it over Dr. King's face and suffocated him to death. And all of this is in William, Cook, William uh, Pepper's book, The Assassination of Dr. King, which I think everybody should read or listen to. You can actually get it off of uh, iTunes or Apple, uh, Apple Books. Okay, let me ask you something else. We yeah. don't, don't they suffocated him to death. And then after they killed Dr. King, they wasn't done because then they killed his brother. Right? He got some A.D. King. The dad, well, remember, the dad, the mama. The right, but the dad did. wasn't murdered. But King was murdered. His brother A.D. was murdered. And his mother was murdered. Shot while she was playing the organ. Exactly. And I believe that was an assassination too. Because what crazy person you know, because allegedly she was murdered by the Hebrew Israelite who drove all the way from the Midwest to come to Atlanta to kill a woman who's not a political activist. What crazy person do you know is going to drive halfway across the country to kill somebody? They're going to mm -hmm. kill them right where they live at. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I believe she knew something. That probably would have helped explain either of her son's assassinations, A.D. or M.L.K., and that's why she had to die. And the brother died because, you know, he was actively investigating who killed his brother, and he said he felt he knew who killed Martin. He said he traced all the steps. He was also working on anti-housing discrimination legislation. It was A.D. King, not M.L. King, who's responsible for black people really getting access to white suburbs and getting their share of Section 8 money. That was A.D. King. Mm. A.D. King, they said, drowned in the pool, right? Yeah. They said he drowned in the pool. But he was, a, I think he was an expert swimmer, number one. Number two, when, they, uh, when the paramedics came and took his body out the pool, there was no water in his lungs. No, how about that? There was no water in his lungs. So if I drown, water going to be all in your lungs. Water going to be all in your lungs. They right. say this man was dead before he hit the water. The paramedic said A.D. King was dead before he hit the water. He was assassinated. They killed King, killed his brother, then killed his mother. Almost reminds you of Malcolm X, right? Because they killed Malcolm X's father working for Garvey. They killed Malcolm, and then they killed Malcolm's grandson. Look at that. Three generations murdered. Kings, the Malcolms. And I bring this up because although sometimes we romanticize revolution too much, mm -hmm. we do this because we have to, not because we want to. You understand? Yes. Dr. King wasn't looking to die. Malcolm wasn't looking to die. Fred Hampton wasn't looking to die. George Jackson wasn't looking to die. Mega Evers wasn't looking to die. Uh, our Prentice Bunchy Carter, John Huggins, little Bobby Hutton, they wasn't looking to die. But you just accept the fact that death can be the inevitable end when you strive for your people. As Huey Newton said, revolutionary suicide. Man. Now we're going, I'm going to ask you this. Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay. I be, and by the way, I believe they gave him Parkinson's disease. Okay. I believe they gave Muhammad Ali Parkinson's disease. Not that you cannot get it because that is a disease that develops amongst boxers. But for Muhammad Ali to be the only boxer of his generation, you got to remember, he was hit less. Yeah. Muhammad yeah. Ali was hit less yeah. than almost any other boxer in his generation. How does he get Parkinson's? They gave him Parkinson's. Okay. They gave him Parkinson's. Let me ask you this because I want to know about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know he... Fought anti going to Vietnam. Oh yeah. How did he manage to live and not get killed by anybody white during that time? Because want to go because white because uh, some of us are spokespersons. Some of us are organizational leaders. A spokesperson can be a threat, okay. but an organizational leader is a definite threat. Muhammad Ali never led a movement. Although he was a spokesperson for us, Muhammad was. Ali single-handedly made black beautiful by himself. Muhammad Ali is the first black man to go on TV and the radio and tell white people, I look 50 times better than you. I'm more oh, attractive than sure you. Was. I'm prettier than you, he your wife, your yeah. daughter. Your, you understand me? You, you, yeah. And by him doing that, he breathed confidence into black people. Mm. Muhammad Ali raised the self-esteem of black America almost by himself. Yeah. And that's why I was always respect him. And the fact that he sacrificed his entire career and livelihood to take a stand for black folks, I don't think there's another athlete whose contribution could be, could eclipse Muhammad Ali's in terms of being a sports protester. Okay. Now, honorable mention? Jim be, Brown? Not quite. Okay. He up there. Okay. But he don't eclipse Ali. What Ali no, did. No, no, no. Do you understand not. me? The only Ali. ones who come close is John Carlos and Tommy, uh, was it Tommy Smith? The Wait, two brothers who did the fist. fist. 
at the Olympics. Took the shoes off for the pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, yeah, them, yeah. them, yeah. them, them two brothers and Muhammad Ali would be number one. Okay. And then I'll put, uh, I'll Al put uh, at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He'll be top ten. Okay, but he ain't top three. Okay. At Colin, Colin Kaepernick got to go up there. Because Colin Kaepernick took the knee when he was still in his prime. You feel me? Right. And one of the issues why I push back against people calling LeBron James an activist, and I love LeBron James. I think he's a good role model for black men. Black wife, never been in trouble. Black children, good father. But LeBron James is not an activist. He's never done anything Colin Kaepernick did. Anything Kareem did. Anything Muhammad Ali did. Jim anything Brown. Kyrie. Anything Jim right, Brown. Right, right. But the NBA has a vested interest in making LeBron James look like an activist because it makes them look like they're tolerant of black militancy. And they're not. So they brand LeBron. LeBron ain't never done nothing. He ain't never took no stand. He's given his voice. But activism is action, not talking. And he doesn't even talk. Yeah, you see, I respect him. But he don't go into activism by LeBron James is not an activist. Never been, never will be. In my opinion, you ask him, he dances around everything. It's like he's, he's, he's and I'm not giving up on him because he's still young. LeBron James only 35, 36. He got time. Do I have a lot of faith that he will evolve into an activist? No, because how many black retired celebrities you know actually became activists? The only time black celebrities become activists is when they get stripped of their money and their power. Now, all of a sudden, they want to be woke. You feel me? Do you feel me? When they get stripped, now everybody remember they black now. Now they know black history, black name, all that. Nah, do it when you're in your prime, bro. Do it when you when you're in your prime. But, you know, the issue that we got now, fellas, is the fact that America is bringing so many minority groups in America, they're using them to replace us. So in Dr. King's day, the white man was the only person we had to worry about. One more, one more. Yeah. It, uh, how long I do no doubt, no doubt. Uh, I wanted to get a picture. Let's do it, let's do it. Oh, on, I, I, I gotta get one. Yeah, is it true that NBA young boy said he don't do no more gangster rap or something like that? Yeah, I've been saying it. It's supposed to get married. I don't know. Okay. I don't tell him, huh? He okay. might drop something next week, you know what I'm saying? I got you. I got you. Yeah, but yeah, he been saying that. <laughs> okay. He said he been scared of all the shit that's been going on and all that type okay. of stuff. I mean, if he's so, flipped, that's a good thing. I mean, oh, yeah, most definitely. If yeah. he do it, this is Dr. King responsible for the integration that took away the black community's economic power. Because he's not. I want to clarify that. Because, okay. you know, a lot of black people try to make him the scapegoat. Dr. King should have never integrated us. We was better when we were segregated. But Dr. King didn't force you to integrate, nor did the government. You chose to go with the white folks. So let me ask you this. Why didn't they try to... I mean, I know you don't know because you weren't there, neither was I. Okay, well, he gave the... Uh, I've been to the mountaintop speech the last Which night. is today. Which is today. Yes, sir. Why did they let him get that out and then try him that night? Did they, did they do it? Because he's it wasn't an easy kill. Originally, the death plan was for him to be shot in the car. He's supposed to be shot in the car and leaving the hotel. Come on. Okay. Wait, yeah. okay. Okay. See? But when he came out onto the balcony, they couldn't resist the easy shot. They never, the killer, the Memphis shoot, sharpshooter, who was hiding in the grassy knoll, he was supposed to shoot Dr. King as a passenger in the car. Which makes me think whoever the driver was wow. would have been in on it. Just like I think whoever the driver was in Notorious B.I.G. assassination, although I'm not comparing the big, big the king at all. Of course. But whoever was the driver in B.I.G.'s car mm -hmm. had, to, I believe, had to be in on Biggie's murder because why did you stop at the light when Puffy's car ran the light? Normally when you to follow a car, you f go yeah. whoever in front of They run the light, you run. Yeah. Biggie's car stopped. And Biggie's car has stickers on it, and his car was the only car with stickers on it. So I believe going back to Dr. King, the driver was going to drive so slow on the takeoff to give the uh, police officer from Memphis Department the opportunity to shoot him. He was supposed to die in the car. But when he stepped out on the balcony, they said, oh, shit, we got a clean look. We got to take it. Wow. So this is stuff that don't be in no book. Mm -mm. Nah. Well, it's in uh, it's three books. The Assassination of Dr. King, Orders to Kill. He wrote three books. William Pepper, you got to check them out. I got the audio book. You ready? Yeah. I know you are. Yeah, that's that's so you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, God. Let me say Yes, sir. Hot 107.1, True Hip Hop, and Home of the Morning Hustle. That was Metro Boomin. I mean, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> Don Tolliver, Justin Bieber Future, sound like some Metro Boomin. Private Landing. I'm in here having the time of my life. Dude, you are dropping so much knowledge. Dr. Uma Johnson is in Memphis, in the studio with you guys, Superman, live here at Hot 107.1. And we've been having interesting 
<laughs> just Devon. Man. But here, let's let's kick it off. Integrating. People think that Dr. King trying to integrate blacks was a killer of our economic system. Yes, sir. Break it down, do you, please. Dr. King is unfairly blamed for the disintegration of the black community in favor of integration. Dr. King only fought to desegregate, or should I say, mm -hmm. the only thing that was desegregated in Dr. King's life was social and public accommodations. Mm -hmm. Hotel, restaurant, public transportation. Do you understand me? Yes. Nothing else. Nothing else. The Civil Rights Bill of 64 was public accommodations. Mm -hmm. But we try to blame Dr. King for why we ain't got no more communities. The schools desegregated before Dr. King. Mm -hmm. The schools desegregated before the Montgomery bus boycott. Mm -hmm. The military desegregated before the Montgomery bus boycott. All other desegregations came after Dr. King died. Dr. King is not the reason the black community suffered through integration. We wanted to be with the white folks. We gave up our independent political power. What's stopping us right now from resegregating ourselves? Right. if you really believe that's the, that's the direction we should go in? Okay. I don't believe we need to self-segregate. I believe we need to empower ourselves politically and economically. In other words, I don't care where you live. I don't care where you live. But make sure we get your money. Right. Make sure we get your business. Right. Make sure we get your support. Chinese live in wherever they want. Indians live whatever they want. European Jews live whatever they want. But when it comes to political and economics, they make sure they keep that shit all within their community. Mm. We have to keep it within our community. We don't do that. Social integration is irrelevant. Political and economic empowerment is where we should focus. We were talking about also Dr. King, the assassination. We know April 3rd, 1968, he gave his final speech. 55 years ago. I have been to the mountaintop. And I asked, just like, well, why didn't they try to assassinate him then and you broke it down yeah. with some things. He was in the with. evening. Right. It was rainy. All them black folks around. It wouldn't have been a good shot. It wouldn't have been a good... He was supposed... Now check this out. Okay. Here's where we got to get strategic with the military setups. Okay. Dr. King was going to be murdered in the car as he drove to dinner at a local friend's home. Mm. He was not murdered on his way to anything political. He was going to dinner. You see that? Yes. So how did they know where he was going? How did they know when he was going? How did they know who he was going with? Mm -hmm. So there was people all involved in that who Dr. King trusted. And when Dr. King died, you know, all respect to Ralph Abernathy, who I think might be an ancestor now himself. Mm -hmm. But I was really disappointed in Ralph Abernathy when he put his book out and the wall came tumbling and the wall came tumbling down mm -hmm. because in the and the wall came tumbling down. He exposed all of Dr. King's extramarital affairs. And I thought that was wrong right. because Dr. King considered Reverend Ralph Abernathy to be his best friend. So if you my best friend and I get assassinated, you put all my business out, even telling people that on the day of my assassination, I had taken company with a woman. Why? Why would you mar his image? And I'll tell you this, what I believe personally, I believe that everybody around Dr. King had some degree of jealousy for Dr. King. That's how it is. In Do life. you understand me? I believe Ralph Abernathy secretly envied Dr. King because he became the man and he didn't. Now, you fighting for the people. Mm. You fighting for the people. What does it matter who out front? Rewind but, the tape. You said he was jealous because he was the man. And, and he, he was wasn't. trying to be. And he was trying to be the man. No, no, no. I mean, let's be honest. Malcolm mm. X was murdered because people wanted his spot. I mean, yeah. let's just be honest. Right. You understand? So we got to understand that the ego of the Negro is something we're going to have to deal with if we're going to come out of this situation because everybody can't be the front man. One day I got to give it to a younger brother. So if I'm more concerned about Dr. Umar being number one, that I'm concerned about black people being number one, when it's time for me to pass the mic, I might kill him. You understand me? Right. I don't want him to take my spot. I'm Dr. Umar Johnson. I've been Dr. Umar Johnson for 40 years. Who this young brother fresh out of college speaking better than me, a stronger Pan-Africanist than me, mm. and more, you understand me? If I love my people, right. young man, it's your time now. Jealousy breeds it's, it's envy. Your, jealousy breeds envy, but it also breeds a lack of progress. We can't move. Because guess what? The, one of the laws of nature is what? The next generation automatically supposed to be better than this one. Correct. The next generation automatically supposed to be better than this one. So if I'm not willing to concede leadership to the next generation, I'm not doing this for black people. I'm doing this to myself. In other words, too many black leaders are serving their ego, but they think they're serving the people.
you, I had to be quiet after that because you just, you said so much stuff right there that people already know but have never heard it broken down like that. Mm. So let's take this ego with politics, mm-hmm. the educational system with the African American men and women growing up, elementary school, junior high, high school. Mm-hmm. I heard you in an interview. I remember back in the day, I'm class of 89, I'm old school. Mm-hmm. We had Votech. You had a way in school, free school, to yep. get a trade, to yep. learn how to live mm-hmm. as an adult, even if you did not go to college, get a degree. Why did they take Votech out of schools? To lay the groundwork for the mass incarceration of black males and to make the black man economically irrelevant to the black woman. The 1970s was the decade of the mass incarceration of black males. This is the laying the groundwork. This is the evolution, right? Mm -hmm. Mass incarceration of black males because America didn't need us no more. Mass incarceration of black males and making a black man economically irrelevant to the black woman. In other words, we're going to make sure his woman does not fight by his side for economic justice. And that's one of the reasons they wrote the welfare programs in the black community. The welfare programs was not to help black women and their children. The welfare programs was to distract black women away from the fact that if you had your man, you wouldn't need welfare. Mm. Uh huh. And even now, the black woman is still being brainwashed, some of them, away from understanding that the black man's unemployment and incarceration is a government created condition. Okay. It ain't because he's lazy. Some are, but not most. It ain't because he don't want to do better. Some don't, but most do. You understand me? Yeah. This is go- the ghetto was created by the government. Mass incarceration was government. Miseducation is government. Gentrification is government. Economic justice is government. Police genocide is government. Here's what I say to black people who say black people are our own worst problem. Mm-hmm. If we are our own worst problem, name one institution we control. Mm-hmm. Give me one. Nothing. We don't control the economy. We don't control the prisons. We don't control the schools. So how can I be my own worst enemy when I control none of the systems that are crushing me daily? Oh, gosh. Because, you know, when they took that out of schools, we know you still have trade schools and Mm -hmm. all that. There was a diminish in the population of black men basically going, taking trades in schools to come out and be successful and raise a family. Now, to the guys out here that are listening to us right now that are kind of in a slump, Mm-hmm. They are misguided mentally. They mm-hmm. have no drive. They are caught in a systematic world of the just hustling and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all that type mm-hmm. of stuff. What is your advice to them? My advice wouldn't be for them as much as it would be for the community. Because remember, it takes a village. And my problem with us as black, as American Africans, is we often segmentalize and fragmentalize populations of the black community as if we don't all contribute to their malady. So the question is not what do black youth need to do different? The question is what does the black community need to do differently so black youth can be empowered? You don't get these drive-by shootings without the black community ignoring the youth. You don't get eight and nine-year-olds robbing old women for their car keys if they were being supervised and raised correctly. So the dysfunction of black youth is the dysfunction of the black community. But if you notice, when you hear these conversations, it's always about black mothers need to do better. Black fathers need to do better. Black youth need to change their behavior. Uh Uh-uh. The black community needs to reinvent itself as a community that cares about its people. We're the only community in America that does not have safeguards to protect its own. You see homeless black people all the time. You understand me? My point is most cultures have a safety net to protect their less They're downtrodden. We don't have a safety net to protect our downtrodden. So what happens to the black downtrodden when they're hungry and homeless? They turn on black people. So in many ways, the violence that's gripping our community is our own collective community karma consciousness. We gave birth to this as much as white America did. The eight-year-old as killer, every black person's DNA is on that eight-year-old as killer's life. Because a black man was on their job, he could have never became a killer. Black men are abandoning the black community we move out to the white suburb. Most I don't know of a black professional man who still lives in a hood he grew up in. I don't know one. Everyone I know I moves know to the couple. suburb. You know a couple, but it's few mm-hmm. and far in between. So if I'm a young 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old black boy, who's going to be my role model if I don't got none in my neighborhood? 
I'm going to go to the rappers. I'm going to go to the basketball players. And you know who's still in the hood? Mm -hmm. You know who's still in the hood? The gangbangers and the drug dealers. And that's why they're the role models. Because all other black men have abandoned our boys. Mm. Okay. Now White America is not going to save us, brother. We got to save ourselves. How do we... Economics okay. and education. We have to start pooling our money together to provide economic opportunities for single mothers, black youth, and of course, black men. Why did America ain't going to hire us? Why you think they got the Afghanis in here? Why you think they got the Ukrainians in here? Why you think they got the Mexicans in here? Why they keep on bringing white Cubans in here? You know why? These are the replacements for the American Negro. Immigration mm -hmm. is the extermination of the American African. Let me ask you this. So... Memphis, Tennessee. We have one HBCU, Lamorne on College. Uh -huh. uh, we have some PWIs, mm -hmm. U of M, CBU, Rhodes, and you have other institutions where you can get an associate's degree. Mm -hmm. Now, I've always said we have in Memphis right now, especially with everything going on, we have more people going to jail mm -hmm. than graduating school. Mm -hmm. So we had a shooting up the road in Nashville. Nashville is very progressive now. They're growing. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. flourishing. Why is it that when a much metropolitan city like that with three HBCUs, Fisk, Meharry, Tennessee State University, where mm -hmm. my dad went, they have PWIs, how is it that they're able to push out such a large number of educated people to get in with the city to push it forward? What would it take for Memphis in our educational system that you think to help that progress like a Nashville? Or progress like an, uh, an Atlanta that is a proud African American city that had a hard time in the '60s, but then came together. And look at it now; it's the Hollywood of the South. It's the mecca, mm -hmm. like Washington D.C. We're talking about Howard mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think is plaguing Memphis versus a lot of black cities that is growing and just doing well? What What do you think? And you've been here before. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would have to study it a lot closer, but I do want to say this. We got to be careful mm -hmm. not to falsely credit the black community with gains that are being orchestrated by the white power structure in the name of gentrification. So when you look at Nashville, when you look at Washington, D.C., when you look at Philadelphia, these cities are being heavily gentrified and so a lot of the uh benefits or the improvements over time are improvements that were orchestrated to cater to the needs of the white people who are returning to those cities okay you see memphis has not yet been hit as hard with the gentrification wave as are some of the other cities in tennessee you understand okay. but it's coming because memphis is one of the most concentratedly black cities in america so it's being left alone until they come up with a strategy for how they're going to move y'all up out of here as well. Because there's a national movement to get all black people out of America's major city centers. They want us gone. They want to swap places with us, with the rural white folks. They want to bring them into the city and push us out there. And do you know why? Once, once we've traded places with the rural whites. Okay. They can do whatever they want to do to black people out there because nobody's paying you no attention. See, anything done to black people in a major city is going to make the news. It's going to be seen. It can't be hid. You understand me? But if you do it out there, you can do it and almost nobody will even know that you did it. Replace and exterminate. That's what they're working on right now. Whew. We got a lot of people here. They they stand out here in the studio looking. Oh my God! Um, one of my most one of the things I've always been interested in with all of you guys. What started you in this movement? How did you get started in the allegiance mm -hmm. to the upliftment of black people? Like okay. what, what, for like, me, it was a uh, black history class in elementary school. We had a mandatory fourth and fifth grade black history class, and that was my introduction to black consciousness and public speaking, and I just never gave it up. Nine years old is all I know since nine. My Catholic school, Father Bertram, uh, St. Augustine now in South Memphis. Okay, okay. We had to do, we had a we had, you know, the regular flag. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Red, black, and green. Okay. So every morning, we would play the religious, you know, they took that out of school. Right. And then we would say Pledge to the RBG. Okay. Every day. So they had a red, black, and green flag. Yes, sir. Our church had all that in it. It was originally okay. on 
Well, it was originally where it is on Kerr. Okay. They had moved from Kerr to Lauderdale. No, no, excuse me. Kerr, then we moved to Lauderdale and Kerr further down. Uh-huh. And it had paintings of a black Jesus. Okay. African American, everything. When you saw Jesus in that church, he was black. Mm. There were no white mm. images. Wow, that's powerful. Jesus. That's powerful. It's not in existence anymore. Ah, ah, we I can take you by the church. My mom and dad got married in that church. Wow. Wow. I was baptized in that church by a black bishop. Uh, well, he's, he was a bishop before he passed away, but he was a priest. His name was Father James, Father Jim, but James White. Okay. That was his name. He was okay. from Chicago. Okay. So, just I just wonder what touches people. Yeah. To get involved with that. Yeah. I um. I mean, we are supposed to be about this business of liberation, but I think some of us are kind of. Groomed ancestrally to come and do this work. You feel me? Because there's really nothing in my immediate background that would explain it. Like, I wasn't raised in black consciousness. We was raised Orthodox Sunni Muslim. My father took us to the mosque. He didn't really give me much. Yeah, right. Elijah's son. But we was Orthodox though, so we wasn't even under him yet, although he came over to Orthodox. Yes, sir. But my mother people was Christian. So there was nothing in my tree. That says he would end up as a black consciousness person. You feel me? Even though I'm related to Frederick Douglass, you know, that's distant. He died, you know, a hundred years before I was born. So first black person. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, I think uh I think I was sent to do the work. But I think that black history class, I'm living proof of how important black history is as an early age. You feel me? I I'm living proof of that. Did you go to HBCU? I didn't go to an HBCU. I wanted to go to Howard for my doctorate, but they never sent the paperwork, bro. I had already got accepted by white school, so this is during the nineties. This is during the nine late nineties. Because paperwork then was mail, no email yet. You get, you would lose something. Remember yeah, the day you everything was mail order. Right. I, yeah. I remember. I, I remember. Oh, oh. Yeah. And in a black school. You send some up there, they're losers. Yes, sir. I, say, I, I wanted to go yeah. to Howard, man. Yeah. I wanted to go to Howard. Me too. Yeah, man. Um, what else inspired you in your black activism? Like Malcolm, Martin? All oh, love them. Of course, Marcus Garvey and Frederick Douglass would be my Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, Nat Turner, John Jacques Dessaline would probably be my my uh, personal Mount Rushmore. I you know, you uh, John Jacques Dessalines, you know, he led the Haitian Revolution to its conclusion after Toussaint was captured by Napoleon. Yes, sir. But those would be my big four. And then on the female side, the Queens, Harriet Tubman, a uh, nanny of the Maroons from Jamaica, Ida B. Wells, and Fannie Lou Hamer. No Sojourner? No Sojourner. I just went to Sojourner Troop gravesite last week when I was in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. That's what you buried? Yeah, she buried there. I went there. And it's funny because when we got there, me and my security was there. And so when we showed up at the gravesite, all these white folks started coming out of nowhere in cars and everything. Like, <laughs> like they knew I was coming. It was almost like, right. but I think they thought I was going to be solo. I don't know if that was a setup. You feel me? Because mm -hmm. if my security wasn't there, I would have been surrounded by crackers. That's a journey truth gravesite. Ain't no black person around. You know what I'm saying? So it was real interesting. Mm -hmm. But Sojourner Truth, we don't give her enough credit. She was before Douglas. Remember, Frederick Douglass was a child when she was out there fighting against slavery. Harry Tubman was a child when she was out there fighting before slavery. She's before all them. She's right. the first black person to win a court settlement against a white man in America. You right. It's a journey truth. First black person to be a full-time public speaker mm -hmm. as well. She's before them. She laid the groundwork for Frederick and Harry. She's an abolitionist. Yeah, and she get left out, man. She get left blue, yeah. black, purple, and proud of it. And this is my guy, my program director. Peace, he brother. How you doing, man? Kid. Yes, sir. All right, King. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I walk in there. I don't know. You know they sweet anyway. The Uber driver ate his fries on the way over here. So, oh man. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> One straight guy and there's like big dog. What's up, man? You the DJ, ain't? I was like, yeah. He was like, let me guess. I ate your fries. Oh, and I was giving you. Yeah, he's proud. He said it's some. Drivers, they may get complaints on by doing it. So I guess because they give you so many, they figure you won't know when they fall over in the but bag. The way that bag was, it looked like it was. Yeah, yeah, yes, badly. Mm -hmm. Though when I showed them, I didn't even, 
I had put it back how it was, left the cup in there, everything I showed it. I said, yeah, man, like half these are gone. He said the bag is all crumbled like somebody was messing with it. Because I know how they, they do their stuff with Chris. See, that's why I don't do who we Dr. Omar. I don't do it. I'm scared. Yeah. I never had any problems with it because, you know, stuff gets so busy up here. I have to get something. I feel you. I've I feel never you. had a problem with it because they know me, though. You know what I'm saying? So when they saw it, they were like, yeah, man. Like, nah. And they gave me my money bag. They remade it. I still hit up Uber, so they gonna give me some. They gonna give me my money back too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love that. My head. Yeah, That's right. right. When I looked at, it, I'm like, no. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> like somebody <laughs> grab, grab them, uh, yeah. grab them a handful. Yeah, the cup was gone. I could tell. You. In the bag, looked like it was slightly. You know, like they took the tape off and they tried to put it back. It's crazy. Um, okay, another question. Black Star Line. Yes, sir. Give Garvin. me, a, a, give me a, a really good good insight. That was... Okay. So with the Black Star Line Steamship Corporation, which was actually incorporated in Delaware where our school is, and we coincidentally bought the school in 2019, which was the centennial of Marcus Garvey's Black Star Line Incorporation of 1919. Right. Mm -hmm. So the Black Star Line was Marcus Garvey's plan to give black people a global distribution network. Mm -hmm. So right now we don't have a global distribution network. You follow me? Mm -hmm. If you well, with Internet, you do now. Right. But if you have something physical that you need to ship and sell across the country, across the world, you're going to have to go to FedEx, UPS, Post Office, DHL, the Chinese, the Arabs. Black people do not have their own distribution. You follow me? And without that distribution, even in music to some extent, a lot of them outside of the independents now, which are growing, they distribute through the majors. Right? One time, about 10 years ago, Puffy didn't have distribution for Bad Boy. He couldn't sell nothing until he signed a distribution deal. So the issue with distribution is that's the only way black people are really going to be able to compete commercially and economically because we can't ship or nothing. If you sell sneakers and you need to get your sneakers into every store across the world, who's going to ship them for you? Because we don't have that. You follow mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. if, 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 if he sells his own car, he make his own car. We but how are you going to get that car? Transport. We can't transport it. So Garvey said with the Black Star Line, we could transport anything black people produce. But that would have destroyed white supremacy. That would have destroyed the economic control of the black dollar. So they had to destroy the Black Star Line. And no black leader since Garvey, no black leader since Garvey has tried to give us a distribution network. There's never been another attempt at a Black Star Liner. So which is our, which is interesting. Why? Mm -hmm. Because more than eighty percent of everything you eat, wear, or use comes by a ship. Do you feel me? Almost everything in your house got to you from a ship because China is the leading manufacturer. Oh, yeah. So it's being shipped over. So without ships, there's no distribution, and that's the importance of the Black Star and Line. That's what happened in the pandemic. All them ships got stuck. They got stuck. They, got, they, got, they slowed down. Absolutely. Couldn't do nothing. We absolutely. Were waiting on cars closed. Absolutely, food, absolutely. And let me ask you this, this with Marcus Garvey. So he was about Pan-Africanism. Yes, sir. And Global wanted, unification of all blacks. Yes. And he wanted all blacks to go back to Africa. No, he didn't. The media said he wanted all blacks to go back to Africa. The back to Africa movement were, was not Marcus Garvey's words. Those words was invented by the white media. They said back to Africa to try to oversimplify Garvey's plan. Marcus Garvey said, quote, some of you are no good in America and will likewise be no good in Africa. I'm only interested. Mm. Yes, those are his exact words. I'm only interested in taking black people from the diaspora back to Africa who have something to contribute to Africa's growth. If you ain't got nothing to contribute, he wasn't interested in bringing you back. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, y'all should have canceled the job. Oh, 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 he was oh, a boy. Hey, you oh, went off. You went off last night. What's going on, guys? Hey, y'all hold it down, son. Somebody pay some money. Hey, y'all hold it down, son. Somebody pay some money. Hey, y'all hold it down, son. Somebody pay some money. Hey, y'all hold it down, son. Somebody pay some money. Hey, y'all hold it down, son. Somebody pay some money. You know what I'm saying? I ain't suck this alone. Oh, you guys are having a good time.